Good morning, dear participants. Good morning, dear speakers. Good morning, dear students. As Dean of KU Leuven Law School, I warmly welcome you to this web conference on the European Convention on Europe at 70, Achievements, Challenges and Interactions with Legal Orders. And I obtained special permission to welcome you from office on campus because you know that we are in Belgium in a kind of lockdown light version. Very happy to be here. Uh, this conference could not have been more timely because it is today exactly 70 years ago on Saturday the 4th of November 1950 that the European Convention on Human Rights or in full Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms was signed by 13 ministers in Rome. And a few weeks later, Greece and Sweden joined and brought the number of signatories to 15. And by adopting this instrument, the governments realized at the time the dream of Winston Churchill, who had defended this idea of a charter of human rights guarded by freedom and sustained by law. Now, as you know, the European Convention was drafted within the Council of Europe, which had been established only one year earlier in 1949. And the beauty of it is that it lays down absolute rights, which can never be breached by the states such as the right to life or the prohibition of torture. And it protects certain rights and freedoms, which can only be restricted when necessary and in a proportionate uh, manner. For example, the right to liberty, right to um, uh, security, or the right to the respect of private and uh, family life. And then we had all these protocols adding additional uh, rights and the abolition of the death penalty, protection of property, etc., right to free elections, freedom of movement. Now, we all know that this convention has been a momentous success. Today, it is living law in not less than 47 Council of Europe member states and it is enforced by one of the most successful and impactful supranational courts the european court of human rights and i'm told that to date some 973,000 applications have already been allocated but as we know success comes with challenges and indeed, various challenges are currently threatening the enduring success of this uh, convention. And I will leave it to the speakers uh, at the conference to elaborate on these uh, challenges. But from my own field of law, which is economic law, competition law, I would, for instance, like to point to the risk of instrumentalization of the human rights uh, convention for purely economic uh, purposes in for example tax law or economic law or competition law cases which have little to do with um, the protection against uh, torture so this will be discussed during all these panels now Ladies and gentlemen, when a dean opens a conference, it is usually not because he or she is an absolute expert in the field, because then he or she would be a speaker. But it is to support the initiative. And this is a very special uh, initiative, because it is a truly faculty-wide initiative. Yeah, we have as a faculty a very strong tradition when it comes to the convention. Our faculty members, former faculty members, actual faculty members are or have been distinguished judges at the ECHR and members of the European Commission 
on uh, human rights. And we also have a strong research tradition, especially when it comes to studying the relationship between the convention and the court on the one hand and other uh, legal orders on the other, such as national constitutional law, the law of the European Union, public international law, and all these uh, subfields like international humanitarian law, refugee law, etc. And so I'm really happy that um, we joined forces, faculty-wide, and we have the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies, the Institute for European Law, the Institute for International Law, the Center for Public Law, all together today uh, took the initiative to co-organize this conference. And uh, beautifully, we can do this in cooperation with the Association of Human Rights Institutes and the European Society of International Law. And this is all to show the dynamic in the faculty uh, tradition around human rights. And I'm really very grateful and very proud of this. Um, you will see this reflected in the different panels. Yeah? We will have a first panel, which is chaired by Professor Kuhn Lemons, our human rights uh, professor, uh, exploring the achievements and uh, challenges related to the convention. Then we'll have a second panel moderated by Professor Sotio. And this panel will inquire the interactions between the convention and the national constitutional legal orders of the uh, Council of Europe member states. In the afternoon, a third panel, which uh, will be led by the latest and wonderful addition to our faculty, Glider Hernandez, will study the many interactions between the ECHR and other areas of public uh, international law. And then we will have a fourth panel, which is chaired by Professor Muir. And this panel will examine the relationships uh, between the ECHR and EU law. And as you know, um, there are many. The planned accession of the EU to the Convention, decreed by Article 6.2 of the Treaty on European Union, will be definitely high on the agenda there. And in between these four panels, um, carry on the cake, will be the keynote address at noon by our colleague, Judge Paul Lemons of the European Court of Human Rights. And Paul will explore whether the European Court is ready for the next uh, 70 years. We all know that Paul himself is ready for the next 70 years, but we wonder whether the convention is also ready for the next 70 years, and he will tell us. And then among the speakers, uh, many international friends of the house, uh, a warm welcome to you too. I recognize some of you uh, whom I met earlier in different capacities. I see that uh, Tobias Locke is, uh, is present, my Brexit partner. Uh, I see that Janneke Gera is present. <laughs> Um, you know, from the research uh, uh, master, etc. We are so happy and grateful to see you all here. Um, a warm welcome, a warm welcome also to the students, our students, our wonderful students who, um, as from this week, were sent from the campus, much to their and my uh, dismay and sadness. But, dear students, it's with events like this that we try to stay in touch and reach out uh, to you. Now, even though this is a coordinated effort, someone, somewhere, took the initiative for it. And that someone, in this case, is Jan, Jan Wouters, um, who again, in his own very efficient and uh, cooperative way, uh, started this whole venture. I would like now to give the floor uh, to Jan, and I wish you all a very stimulating conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Dean, dear Walter. Dear colleagues, um, participants, students, you see that the sun is shining on my face. I'm in my office in Leuven as well. 
Um, and allow me just to share a few thoughts at the opening of this conference, because in fact, our Dean has already told you all that you need to know. First of all, anniversary events of important international organizations or treaties, such as the present one, tend to have a very high déjà vu character. For instance, when in 2018, we celebrated the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights with a conference in Leuven, many well-known issues sprang up again, inspiring us also to a recently published book you don't see uh, because of the sunshine, Can We Still Afford Human Rights with Elgar Publishing. So far, this little commercial, I was asked by my co-editors to, to do this in this introductory session. But also the achievements of and the challenges for the European Convention on Human Rights are very well known. They have been discussed plenty, plenty of times before. But still, with today's conference, we hope to generate some added value. First of all, we will discuss some recent challenges for the Convention notably in the face of COVID-19. Jeff Kenner will touch upon that in panel one. In the face of climate change, Gary Liston in panel three will touch on that, but also in the face of what is a rising tide of authoritarian regimes throughout the Council of Europe and the European Union, I should say. Katrien van der Heining in panel two will touch on that. But we will also now investigate how the European Court tries to navigate the many challenges of its interaction with other players and other legal regimes. Because indeed, this is a crowded field. And the other players to start with are not just the sometimes unruly national courts, including national constitutional courts of the member states of the Council of Europe, which is a crucial topic, because indeed, their primary role in enforcing the respect of the Convention in tune with the principle of subsidiarity has become ever more central in the recent past. And I'm sure that our colleagues Paolo Di Stefano in panel one will touch on the Italian experiences, whereas Willem Verheid in panel two will share some of the Belgian experiences in that regard. But there are plenty of other actors as well, including, for instance, the role of civil society actors in the convention scheme. Antoine Beuze in panel one will touch on that. Or think of the United Nations, and more in particular, what the United Nations Security Council has been doing with regard to targeted sanctions. Kushtrim Istrevi in panel three will look into this. And then there is the question of the interaction between the convention and the many other legal regimes out there. That includes, of course, as Wouter has just said, the interactions between the Convention and the European Union and the case law of the European Court of Justice. Markella Papaduli, Cecilia Ricciala, and Tobias Locke will take a look at this in panel four. But it also has to do with interactions with other legal regimes, for instance, in international law, think of the uh, draft articles of the International Law Commission on state responsibility and the whole question of the attribution uh, rules on international responsibility. Marco Milanovic will touch on that in panel three. And then there are, of course, many other sub-themes of international law that the Convention constantly uh, interacts with. But let's not forget that in the very first place, the Convention interacts with the national legal systems of the member states of the Council of Europe. And in that respect, Janneke Gerards in panel two has some very, very interesting things to share with us about the European Court's original way of navigating between on the one hand uniform protection and on the other hand, the respect for national diversity. And so has Andrew Legg who will discuss the European Court's margin of appreciation and judicial difference in panel three. So in short, this, this promises to become a very rich conference. All in all, more than 20 speakers, including the Belgian judge, 
at the European Court, Professor Paul Lemons, will engage with you today on these fascinating issues. We hope we will all learn from it, and we look very much forward to stimulating exchanges. And my colleagues, the moderators, who are the co-organizers of today's conference, will also be able to take questions from you through the chat box. So I wish you all a fascinating day. It's a quarter to 10 Leuven time, and that means we now turn to panel one, chaired by our colleague and friend, Professor Kuhn Lemons. Thank you very much.